Welcome to Screen Slurps, the movie review podcast where we discuss the good, the bad, and the savage in the world of cinema. I'm Adam Meisner. And I'm Laura Meisner. And this week, we are talking about The Count of Monte Cristo. Monte Cristo. Wow. Where it's based in France, but no one can speak French or have a French accent. <laughs> Particularly me. I can't speak French. <laughs> Uh, je m'appelle Laura. I was thinking of so many different things as I said that film title. First, I was thinking the count, like we're talking about vampires, and then I was thinking the count, like for some reason, I was thinking of Cap and Crunch, but that might be mm-hmm. because of one of my side slurps. Well, he of, looks like Napoleon with the hat. Napoleon's in this movie. That true? Yes, that is true. <laughs> Um, and then I was also thinking of, as we talk about vampires, the count like Sesame Street. Yeah. Well, and I think of Monte Cristo, which is a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> it's a type of sandwich. I think it's like really bad for you. It's like deep fried and it has like ham and cheese and stuff. I've never had a Monte Cristo, so I'm going to have to look into this. <laughs> ne- which I didn't know it was a sandwich. Yeah. It sounds very like, like a Cubano or something. It's like a... Uh, heart clogger it's bad it's like i think it's got a lot of calories i don't think it's good sandwich i hope that the count of monte cristo isn't just a sandwich dealer who's just but he will kill you slinging (laughs) slinging sandwiches across the the plains of france like the sandwich he will kill you (laughs) we'll be telling you all about the count of monte cristo this week and unfortunately it does not involve him sandwich dealing he does many different things uh Sandwich not even dealing. one baguette in this movie. <laughs> Sandwich dealing is not one of them. But before we get into that, we're going to be telling you all about our side slurps of this week. That's right. Our side slurps are the things that Laura and I have been doing other than watching The Count of Monte Cristo, our film of the week. Things like watching other movies, maybe watching other TV shows, maybe even doing things completely unrelated to film. Things like... Oh, I don't know, looking out into the plains of Chicago and seeing people going to coffee shops and maybe even the Do Division Street Festival, or maybe there's other music things going on that I'm just not aware of because I'm playing my own music, or maybe I'm just dreaming of flying in the sky on the back of a dragon and imagining what, the is great this mystics going story? on. <laughs> That's another film. So, hey, it could be. Go jump on Falcor and fly away. I'll have to watch Never Ending Story now again just to revision the wonders of uh, doing things like that. You know, there's a few I just always remember where the horse dies and it's really sad. Why does it have to be something pleasantly wonderful like flying (laughs) on a dragon? And then we talk about a horse dying. Because that's what stands out in my mind from that movie and it's really depressing. Man. Atreyu? I think that's the name. Or is that the kid's name? Someone's Atreyu name. Atreyu is a metal band. No, it's the name of, of either the horse or the boy in Never Ending Story. <laughs> it's for the God. Now we know the inspiration that goes behind music out there. There we go. All right. So, Laura, what have you been up to this past week? <laughs> yeah, I, I have like lots of things on my side slurps, but I'll try to keep it a little brief. Um, Last weekend, I went home to Michigan because it was my sister's birthday but also her bridal shower so she's getting married in two months now um so for her birthday we went and saw six the musical which was absolutely amazing it was so so good so adam i don't really know if you know what six is about but it's about the six wives of king henry the eighth don't quote me on that number it's king henry i think it's the eighth yeah henry the eighth i yeah. am yeah da, 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 da. he had six wives right and the wives some of them were he beheaded <laughs> some of them just died and some of them he like divorced so what the show is it's the six wives and they're like a pop band like the six of them and they're on essentially what they're creating to be this reality singing competition to see like who had the worst life (laughs) with the king like who had it the worst and they're all competing against each other they each have like a song and they talk about their lives and with the king and how it all went Um, but at the end they band together and realize like no we're strong and 
like the king because he's a horrible man. But the music's so poppy and costumes, like it was so much fun. Six was great. It sounds intense. It was so good. And then, like I said, other than that, we were home for her bridal shower. It was really cute. It was like lemon themed. Emily loves lemons. So it was nice to spend time with you know, my brother-in-law, future brother-in-law and his family and, and my family. And it was really nice. Nice, nice weekend. Let's see. Other than that, I'm currently rereading the From Blood and Ash series by Jennifer Armentrout. So I just finished the first one. Uh, Adam, you will, you know, I've talked about this a million times. It's one of my fantasy smuts. <laughs> this one's more involved, though. It's a lot more plot. There's smut in it, but it's there's a lot happening. So it's not just nonsense smut. So I'm currently reading the second book of that now because I just finished the first. And then non like media related things, I have gotten back into doing my embroidery, which is a lot of fun. So I'm currently embroidering actually a pair of Converse for my sister to wear at her wedding. So putting all those flowers on there, making it look nice. Yeah. Other than that, we're still in our Marvel binge. So we just finished all of WandaVision, which was a lot of fun. And then we watched um, Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings, which was good. We're almost caught up, which I'm kind of excited about. A lot of Marvel to get through that's it's out a, there. It's a lot of Marvel. <laughs> the TV shows make it longer, too, because then you're like, oh, man. Instead of just like one three-hour movie, I've got six to eight one-hour episodes. Yeah. But we're getting there. We're doing it. And that's it. That'll stop there. What have you been up to, Adam? I have started working on creating a short little video game project for myself just to try and teach myself a little more about programming. I've had these phases in my life of teaching myself how to use Unity and C-sharp programming off and on throughout my days. So, so that's been a thing. And most recently, I've been trying to teach myself to make this Tetris-like video game as a, in my mind, a little bit of a simplistic project. But as a baseline, the foundation of it is like Tetris. But that's more or less the starting point for the game. And then as I create that, I've been trying to build off of that more and more. So just as a beginning, it's like just... Tetris, you get the blocks going down, you get it to play like Tetris. But then how can I make more of that than just the game itself? So it's right now it's just the game of Tetris, really, but it's not entirely playable yet in my mind. So you don't quite have the game finishing up cleanly or even starting cleanly in, in my mind. So it's a matter of implementing score points to display for the player and having the game you know show text for when the blocks hit the top of the screen and telling you you know game over would you like to play again things like that and once i can implement all of those elements as well it's a matter of also putting in some nice background music maybe even allowing the player to change the music possibly and uh implementing some more original art design into the game as well and so now that I've got the foundation laid down, I want to just add more and more elements to make it a little more original. Yeah. So I played it. It was fun. That's what I'm it's working Tetris. on right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the foundation is there. It's a matter of me just taking a little bit more of a look at it and seeing how much more can I just alter this a little bit just to make it a little more and more uh, for the player. And as I work on that, I'm also working on some more original music, some more new stuff. And as I've been looking at that video game, I've been listening to a lot of chiptune music just because I like listening to, you know, stuff that's not just chiptune related. But the chiptune stuff is just because I've been working on that video game. And it really reminds me of my childhood days of playing Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis and all the old video Hearing games. That all the time. And I do own a copy of the program Little Sound DJ on a Game Boy cartridge. And that is also very fun. If you guys have never used little sound dj before listeners if you've never checked out little sound dj you can get it as a software program or i believe you can still order it 
to be put onto a Game Boy cartridge to put into a Game Boy and used that way to create your own chiptune music. And it is a wonderful program. It's really cool. So I have it so that you can actually use it on a Game Boy, a physical Game Boy. And it does take time to sit down and really go through the programming of it. But I did create a cover of the Daft Punk song, Something About Us, at one point, just for fun. And uh, doing I, that. I'm amazed by it. And I could never do that. I can never figure it's it out. It's just fun to do stuff like that. So I would like to use Little Sound DJ a little bit more for my own original material to make chiptune music with square waves and sine waves and little drum beats and things like that. So very, very fun to make things like that. And another side slurp that I did most recently was I went and saw the Blue Man Group Woo! with Laura and and her dad. Yeah, and it's my dad's birthday. Happy birthday, dad. <laughs> He's currently sitting on the porch while we record this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the three of us, those two have seen the Blue Man Group before. I, on the other hand, have never seen the Blue Man Group before. It was my first time. And what a good first time. Yeah, I got invited onto the stage to <laughs> be involved in a bit um, unknowingly get it, to get married to somebody <laughs> on stage with the Blue Man Group. Um, I'll also Not have really you know, married I everyone. didn't actually get married uh, on stage. Unfortunately, uh, you yeah. recently married me. It was, it was a bit. <laughs> it was just a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, it was all just uh, just staged. So um, It was funny though. My dad was <laughs> dying. He was so happy last like at the Blue Man Group. He was giddy laughing. He was having the best time. And when you went up and they pulled you up on stage as you were walking up there, my dad was like, oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> I did not know what to expect. And that, it was very funny, though. And it was the, a great show. the other person that was on stage with me, she seemed very embarrassed She's about the whole thing. And yeah. um, it was it was very funny, though. The whole thing was just hilarious. And a great show overall. Yeah. They're just fun to watch. Yeah, it, it very talented too. Mm-hmm. It was a yeah. I I can't even put into words really how incredible it was to see the kind of bits and uh, things that they were doing on the stage. Things they can create. Yeah. yeah. So very very cool to see the kind of things that they do on stage. So definitely worth checking out if you've never seen Blue Man Group before. And that's really the stuff that I have been up to this past week. And in film news, I do have to say one of the cool or interesting things that I read about recently, I I mean, I just got to say it, the uh, the Oppenheimer film prints, for those who are aware of Christopher Nolan's new film Oppenheimer, the Oppenheimer film prints are so long that the IMAX prints are 11 miles of film stock. And weigh some 600 pounds. This is in the news. You can read about it yourself. Check it out. Look online. So extra. But 11 <laughs> miles of film stock? That's nuts. They're, Chris Reynolds is just so extra. <laughs> I can understand. It. It's a long movie. Yeah. Like, I wonder what the reel looks like for the 70 millimeter screening. That's Should what it is. Screen. It's a, like 11 miles. Yeah. Oh, that's the, that's what it is? Yeah. Wow. How do you put that all on a, one reel? Like... How big is that? I want to see a a picture. But yeah, um, that's why I'm very curious to be seeing. I want it to be known that Adam and I will be seeing both Oppenheimer and Barbie that weekend because I really want to see Barbie. And I think it deserves the box office credits as well as Oppenheimer. (laughs) We will be seeing both movies that weekend. Yeah, I'm very excited to see both movies they're both gonna be very different from very one another, different but... movies yeah maybe we should start with oppenheimer because it's like intense and then we can end the night with like happy barbie <laughs> well we'll see how it goes we'll see uh what do i have in in movie news i have well not really movie related but listeners you know before i've talked about this i play dreamlight valley It's one of my games, and we've just gotten this last week, many more updates about the upcoming updates of the game. So early this June, we're getting a new update of Dreamlight Valley, where it looks like we're getting some new quest lines that are related to the Forgotten Lands, which is uh, one of the biomes on the map that really we haven't been able to do much with yet. 
So I'm really looking forward to that. And then they finally announced who the new, some of the new characters will be. So like one of the hints they gave us before was this princess races into the valley. And I was like, well, obviously it's got to be Vanellope because she races. But everyone else is like, oh, it's going to be Cinderella or it's going to be blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, racing. It's obviously Vanellope. And they confirmed this last week that Vanellope is joining. I think that's in like the September update, though. But yeah, so I love Dreamlight Valley. I think it's lots of fun. So I'm looking forward to the new updates coming in because I'm caught up on all the quests. So I need stuff to do. So, so that'll be good. And then the other news that I had was that I saw that they're making a live action remake of How to Train Your Dragon. And I don't know how I feel about that. They're making a live action remake of just about every Disney like movie. Aristocats. So. That's with Bambi. Quest, the quest Love, though. So Bambi. <laughs> Why? See, why? Like, the haven't they learned from the past, like, five years of them doing these remakes that the remakes aren't very good? Like, no one likes them. <laughs> like, Aladdin sucked. <laughs> and, I mean, no one watches. Like, why? Why are they still doing this? No shade to Little Mermaid, though, because I haven't watched it yet. So that one, I feel like, might be good. But all the other live-action remakes I've seen are, like, crap <laughs> we've all heard the words come out of her mouth now and when we go see it then uh, we'll tell you otherwise yeah i do want to go see it i think it might actually be good the little mermaid one all the other ones suck <laughs> <laughs> fast forward to when bambi comes out Ugh, no i'll cry we can't see bambi his mom dies <laughs> that's it that's all i got for movie news <laughs> now i'm sad <laughs> oh my god what if they did a live action fox and the hound I would never. Oh, Lord. I couldn't. I, I literally could not go watch it. That movie like traumatized me as a child. I can't see it. It'd be a good friend movie. Friend movie. Yeah, because the fox and uh, the the hound, they're, they're, they're pals. Yeah. Copper. <laughs> <laughs> Copper. What's and his name is Tom? Yeah, Todd. To- Todd. Todd. Yeah. Oh, copper. It's, and then the old lady leaves him in the forest at the end and drives away. It's so sad. I hate that movie. All right. Let's, when you're the best of friends. So sad. Let's stop talking about it and talk about our actual movies. All, All right. right we'll, we'll talk about some real f- best Monte friends. Monte Cristo won't make me sad. <laughs> Some a real friend movie here. Oh, yeah, this, this is all about the best bullets. <laughs> this week's film, The Count of Monte Cristo, from 2002, directed by Kevin Reynolds, screenplay by J. And excuse me for my pronunciation here, please. J. Wol- Wolpert, Wolpert. Um, sure. sorry, sorry, Jay. I'm trying. <laughs> Based on the book, The Count of Monte Cristo, by. Alexander Alexandre Dumas. Thanks, Laura. You got to be a little French there. I got to be French in the 1800s here. Let me let me just say this is based upon the book. Um, there, as I said here, based on the book that let, I can't. I, I gotta go back <laughs> here. Blah, 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 blah. The and Count of Monte Cristo. The, the Count of Monte Cristo. Did you know that this movie was the 17th adaptation of the book? What what other kind of adaptions were oh, there? Oh, there's tons of movies, Adam. There's tons of mo- like older ones. This oh. movie is this book has been made into a movie a gazillion times. There's probably a play, like if this is the 17th one. I'm sure it's mostly movies, but I bet you there's some plays. I wouldn't be surprised if there's like an opera or something. I mean, it. I can imagine that. I mean, this is also the, just about the same time that Les Mis was written. written yeah. So. And this was a popular like this is a classic. It's a well-known book. So I think there's lots of older films of this. Yeah. We should watch some of the older ones. I think there's one with Gerard Depardieu, actually. I might be making that up. I don't know if you know who Gerard Depardieu is, but he's like a famous French actor. He yeah. was like Cyrano and he was in Three Musketeers. Makes sense. And he was in Lame Mouse, I think. Anyway. But to continue on, <laughs> the movie was produced by Gary Barber, Roger Bim Bimbom. Bim-bom-bom. Roger Bimbom and Jonathan Glickman. And the film stars a wonderful cast, Jim Caviezel, Jim Caviezel, Guy <laughs> Pierce, Richard Harris, James Frain, Dagmara Dominicki, Dominic, 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 apologies, everyone. Dagmara, <laughs> We're butchering pronunciation. Dagmara Dominic, 
Louis 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 Guzman. <laughs> I was about to say Louis. You know how to say this one, Adam. Louis Guzman. <laughs> Louis, and Henry Cavill. Yeah, Louis Guzman and very young Henry Cavill, among many others. I feel like this had to have been one of his first things. Henry Cavill, he was young. Yeah, he was a very young Henry Cavill. But However, know, his, actually, he was only like seven years younger than the woman that was playing his mother. Yeah. Is that, was that what you were about to say? That was what I was about oh, to say. I took your fun fact. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you stealer I'm no sorry. It's, it's all good um yeah so henry cavill but he, regardless he was a very young man in this movie the thing is it, it's funny to see henry cavill so young in this movie and then years later it, he becomes superman you know yeah. it's just and the witcher and the witcher yeah that's him right yeah yes yeah after I said it, I was like, shit, is that him? <laughs> Do I know who Henry Do Cavill is? is? <laughs> but the cast is great. I mean, Jim Caviezel is so good. But I was telling you, this. so I watched this movie growing up. That's why I made Adam watch this movie this week for us to review. I don't know how I got this movie, but I watched it a lot growing up. And I had a huge crush on Jim Caviezel in this movie. Like, he was, he's great. And then he played Jesus in The Passion of the Christ. And it like, I was like, oh, God, I <laughs> I can't have a crush on Jesus. It was very strange to me. And Guy Pierce, who I also have a weird like obsession with. It's a it, there's a great cast. And Dumbledore. Yes. Um the first Dumbledore. The first Dumbledore. Richard was Harris. Richard Harris. Yeah. Such an iconic voice. So just to give a general idea of what this movie is about, a general uh, synopsis so to speak of what we're really toying with with this movie. If you've never seen The Count of Monte Cristo, I completely understand. I'd never seen The Count of Monte Cristo before Laura reeled me into this movie. As as she mentioned, she had watched this movie numerous times, and there I sit as she tells me this, like, I, I don't know what kind of blasphemy you speak of. I've read the book also. And I, I knew nothing of the <laughs> sort. So I watched this movie, and I, I had no idea what I was getting into, but... To give you an idea of what you're getting into, here's the story. The Count of Monte Cristo. The classic story of an innocent man wrongly but deliberately imprisoned and his brilliant strategy for revenge against those who betrayed him. Dashing young sailor Edmund Dantes. Dantes. Thanks, Laura. Is a guileless and Edmund. honest young man whose peaceful life and plans to marry the beautiful Mercedes are abruptly shattered when his best friend, Fernand, Mondego. who wants Mercedes for himself, deceives him. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah, so essentially... It's a movie on revenge. Edmond, Edmond. and Fernand are they're great names I love <laughs> <laughs> they're buddy o pals and Mondego. they're friends they do things together i mean like they yeah. hang out they're... but i think you have to understand the dynamic of their friendship right so fernan M- M- uh, mondego is rich he's from like a wealthy family i think his dad's like a duke or something so he he's rich but he was like never happy you know he he never He had so much, but he was never fulfilled. Then he sees his friend Edmund, who's poor, like he comes from a poor family, but he's like so happy with his life and he feels like he's like so accomplished. And so Fernand is so jealous of him because he's like, I'm rich, like I'm privileged. Why? Why do I want to be you? You know, and that's like so they're friends, but there's this whole dynamic. And as you mentioned, like Fernand the whole time wants Mercedes, but Mercedes and Edmond are planning to get married. Mm. And it even opens like with with Fernand. They're waiting for Edmond to come. Fernand's like, just sleep with me. Edmond will never know. No. (laughs) And Mercedes is like, no, I love Edmond. No. So it's a friendship, but is it really a friendship? To Edmond it is, because he's like so naive that he doesn't realize that Fernand's like a horrible human being. So he thinks to him it is like this is his best friend. But I like, no, Mondego, no. He's like, it's a friend of me. Yeah. But Edmond does not get that. He does not understand that Mm-mm. until things all turn on him. It's too late. <laughs> yeah, until it's <laughs> too, too late. late. Too late, baby. Yeah, so as things go along in the beginning of the movie. Edmond is given a letter to deliver in in the town. To but who gives him the letter? That's important. 
Napoleon. Oh, himself? Yeah, when they were on that island, it's Napoleon Bonaparte, Adam. I'm trying to... Napoleon Bonaparte. Yeah, so Napoleon, right? He was the leader in France, but he was overthrown, and he was exiled to the island. El- Elba? Elba. Elba. Um, Idris Elba? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Napoleon was sent to this island He to, like, imprisoned, essentially, and lived there. And... Uh, Edmond and Fernand, they they work for a shipping company, like a trading company. So they're on a ship and their captain gets really sick. And they try to save him, they go to this closest place where they are, which is Elba. So they get on the island and they're almost killed because you can't be there. It's Napoleon's prison. Uh, but Napoleon's like, oh no, let them be. They're not, they're not with me. You know, they're not trying to set me free. And they try to help the captain, but the captain dies. But while they're there, I think Napoleon realizes that Dante Edmond is naive and he's like, oh, I can, you know, convince him to take this letter back to the mainland for me so that I can be set free. So he tells he gives this letter to Edmond and says, don't tell anyone about it. It's just a letter to a friend. You know, I just miss him. (laughs) It's just a letter. It's nothing. But Fernand sees Edmond being given this letter and he knows that he shouldn't be because it's obviously probably a way for napoleon to escape so when they get back to the mainland you know edmund tries to figure out who to give the letter to and he doesn't know who to give it to but fernand's like screw you dude i know you have this letter i'm gonna turn against you and then he gets called a traitor a traitor and and he gets sent to prison by forney (laughs) the actor james frayne who plays the like commissioner whatever he's called the the police guy. Uh, he plays this character called Forney and Where the Heart Is, which is another movie I watched a lot growing up as a kid that my sister and I absolutely loved. And anytime I see this man, I think of Forney. So it's really weird to see him in like a normal, <laughs> a normal role. Um, but yeah, like, Ad- like, like Adam just said, you know, Mondego goes to Villefort, the commissioner, and tells him that Edmond received a letter from Napoleon. You know, we... He's being a traitor. So Villefort brings in Edmond and says, hey, did you take a letter from Napoleon? And Edmond's like, yes, but I never delivered it. So Villefort takes and he's like, well, if you never delivered it, then no harm, no foul, right? Like you're free to go. But as Edmond is leaving, Villefort's like, well, wait a minute. Who who are you supposed to deliver this letter to? And when Edmond responds, Villefort suddenly is like, oh, and then he decides to have Edmund in prison. So at this point, we realize that Villefort must somehow know the person who is supposed to receive the letter. And he doesn't want that to get out, that he's connected somehow to a Bonapartist. And so he has Edmund arrested and sent to prison for life. Yeah. And we learn who that letter is supposed to go to, I believe, later in the movie. Yeah, I think it kind of alludes to it earlier, but I think when they like, officially say who it was it is later in the movie yeah so but we learn is Villefort's father yeah dun 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 dun. so but Edmund doesn't know that like he didn't he's like you said I could be free but now all of a sudden I'm getting sent to this prison like what happened and he doesn't know who turned against him who turned him in like he he just does he's like what What's happening to my life? Yeah. And he's trying to get Villefort to let him go. He's like, Villefort, yeah. Villefort. Huh. And then poor, like his poor family, his dad and Mercedes, Mercedes and Fernand all come to Villefort and they're like, he's not a traitor. Like, what are you doing? And we, this is when we learn that Fernand is a bad man and him and Villefort yeah. are like working together to get Edmund yeah. sent and away. And Fernand is like, hey, Mercedes, we're going to get married. Yeah, he's like, I will protect you since Edmund is no longer here. That sly dog. <laughs> <laughs> they say it just like that in the movie, too. You sly, you sly dog. dog. Um, this, so I read the book a really long time ago, and I honestly do not remember most of it. But when I was researching notes for like, for doing the episode, I was looking at some of the things that are differences between like the movie and the book. And I will say one of the differences is that in the book, actually, um, Mondego and Dantes aren't friends. So that is something that they changed uh, for the movie so that there would be more of that feeling of like being betrayed um, because like I said, in the book, they're not friends. I mean, obviously, Fernand still has this, like, wants to be with Mercedes, but he and Dantes are not best friends. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and I think that's a smart decision to make because if there's no kind of friendship or anything like that, certainly there's less to work off of in terms mm-hmm. of uh, a conflict or well, any it kind, kind of, of like Yeah, and it makes his reason for revenge like more, you know what I mean? Because it was his best friend that turned against him and took his... Right. Otherwise, it's just some rando right. that's like, hey, I'm taking your woman. And yeah. you know, have well, a it was someone that he still knew, but like not someone that he was friends with. It was like a work colleague versus, yeah. versus a BFF. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then Edmond goes off to prison and thinks he's just going to be in this cell. Kind of sucks, but, you know, that's how it starts off. And then he ends up getting tortured in the cell the introduction to that is pretty brutal actually it's uh i I would say in terms of the writing in this it's very well introduced to how they're going to torture him because edmond you know leads it up like well you know god's all around us and he'll help me out basically and um the man who's torturing him is basically like okay as soon as god shows up then i'll stop right Right. It's like, OK, well. And what's so upsetting, too, is like when when Edmond shows up at the prison, he tells the guard, he's like, I know you hear this all the time, but I am innocent. And the guard is like, oh, I believe you. I believe you're innocent. He's like the Chateau Deef, which is the prison that he was sent to. He's like, this is where they send people that, you know, are pretty essentially innocent and they never want to be seen again for reasons or another. So, yes. Yeah, so the prison guy is like, I, I bet you are innocent, but. It's the way the world works. You're stuck here. <laughs> yeah. And it's very, it is like you were just saying, Adam, it is really interesting that we see, you see how beaten down essentially Edmund gets. Cause in the beginning he's like, you know, God is with me. I will, you know, I will survive this. And by the end he's like, fuck this. Like God, it doesn't <laughs> exist. Like my life is shit. You really see like how the prison has like beaten him down. Yeah. It it's it's intense. It's very intense. And as that goes along with him being in prison, that's kind of the introduction to him being in prison. But as that goes along, we get the introduction of our next character. Dumbledore. Yeah. Um Richard Harris's character. Yeah. Um who's not called Dumbledore in no. this movie, unfortunately. Fa- Faria, Faria, Faria. He's uh, a, the abbe. The, he's yeah. like a priest. Yeah, Abbe Feria. I think it's Feria. Which his uh, excuse for showing up with Edmond is that he was digging a hole in the ground to escape, and he dug the wrong direction. So <laughs> and he, he digs dug up in, through Edmond's yeah, prison. He cell. dug up into Edmond's cell. So he basically spent his entire prison days uh, digging the wrong direction. Yeah, so. and he's like an old man, obviously. He's old, so he's probably been in this prison for a really, really long time, digging and digging. And how upsetting would that be to realize like you were digging into just another cell Yeah, and not out? Yeah, but he's a great character. He's the one that kind of like turns Edmund's life around at this point, right? Because we learn he also is essentially an innocent man that has been in prison in the Chateau D for years, like decades, I think. And the reason he was in prison was that he worked for this man who was who had this treasure, who was like super wealthy. He had found this treasure or whatever and had hidden it away. And when he died, other people came then to Feria to say like, where is this treasure? Where is it? And uh, Faria would never admit to knowing where it was. So they imprisoned him because he never told them where the treasure was. And yeah, he's just like a really well-educated man. He can fight. He knows like economics and philosophy. Like he's just this very, very smart man. And so over the next how like years, I think they are together, him and Edmond help. They work together to dig this tunnel. And while they're digging the tunnel to escape, Feria is essentially like educating Edmond. You know, he teaches him how to fight. He teaches him about life and economics and everything. Like he makes him into this Renaissance man. Yeah. I don't remember how many years was that. I think in total, Edmond was in prison for. I actually don't know. I think I feel like it's like long, like 11 years or something. Because I thought he was on the pirate ship for like seven years or something. No, he wasn't with the them that long. You mean after he escapes? Yeah. I don't think he was with them that long, was he? 14 years he was in prison. 
six years by himself. And so that means eight years with Faria. Is that math right? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because seven and seven is 14. So it'd be six and eight. So he spent six years in prison alone. And then Faria found him and they, he had another seven years with him. So he was in prison for 17 years? Or? 14 years. Six plus eight. 14. Oh. So he's in prison for 14 years. Yes. All right. That's the math. <laughs> he was only with the pirates for a short period of time. But that's jumping ahead. We got to get him out of prison first. <laughs> so Edmond is in prison for 14 years total. Yes. <laughs> and he gets out of prison finally. But the way he gets out is sad. That's true. Dumbledore, uh, Abe, uh, Feria. <laughs> I mean, I got to call him Dumbledore. It's fine. He is Dumbledore. I just have to mention the name. Um, And actually, actually, this movie, The Count of Monte Cristo, was the very last movie to come out during Richard Harrison's lifetime because Harry Potter came out after he had died. It was like he had already passed away before the movie came out. Mm. So Count of Monte Cristo is the last movie that came out while he was still alive. That's too bad. Yeah. But he passes away in this movie yeah the tunnel collapses on him yeah and he tells edmond the coordinates to the treasure Mm -hmm. before he dies and edmond ends up leaving the prison by swapping bodies with him in the body bag so there's a body bag that they're gonna take ferris's body out of the prison in and throw him off the cliff into the ocean, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, And what Edmond does is he takes Ferris's body out of the body bag, puts his body in there, and then is going to um, have his body, Edmond's body, tossed into the ocean um, so they can toss him off into the ocean. He can get out of that prison. And uh, he does. He does it. There's a bit of a struggle. Because they realize that he switched bodies like right before they throw him over, but he does escape. He does it, and he takes the, the man, bad like, man, captain yeah, the prison with guy, him. yeah. Who and that actor, he plays the, I like, I think it's the sheriff of Nottingham in the Kevin Costner. No, because Alan Rickman's a sheriff. It's like his like second or whatever. He's in Prince of Thieves. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, is what I'm getting at. I'm amazed that that captain even lived as long as he did when they, when he got pulled down there. Like if you would have fallen that far. Well, yeah. How did Dantes survive? Yeah. Like, I feel like you would have, and it's rocks everywhere. Yeah, hit a like, rock when you fall down there. You would have, yeah, you would have gone. But anyways, he does die. He, <laughs> Edmund lives. He gets out of there. Edmund survives. He doesn't drown. I'm amazed. But. He swims to the next little land, wherever and then he is. Sees a bunch of pirates. Yes, yes, yes. The pirates who were led by Luigi Vampa. Yes, it's a it's the new version of Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> da, da, dun, da, da, dun, Very da, different dun, dun, vibe. Dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> Very different vibe in France than it is in the Caribbean. But you know, where's Jack Sparrow when you need him? <laughs> so Edmond washes ashore on to wherever this is, and he comes across these bandits, these pirates, and the leader of them, Luigi Vampa, is like, oh, this is a great timing for you to show up. We are just about to kill one of my crewmates, Jacopo. A.K.A. And, Louis Guzman. Yeah, Louis Guzman. He's like, we're just about to kill him, but a lot of our other you know, mates don't want him dead. So how about you fight him to the death? <laughs> and if you kill him, you know, he had the chance to try and free himself, and he he couldn't. Uh, but if and if he kills you, then he's freed himself. It's it works for all of us. <laughs> so Edmund's like, sure, I'll fight him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why not? He's like, you think he's the best knife fighter? Well, then you haven't seen nothing yet. <laughs> I learned from Faria. <laughs> I can fight you. And so then they try to duke it out with one another. And Edmund begins to kick his ass and <laughs> basically tells him to his face that it's like, don't start making moves on me and like I'll work everything out. And then he tells the pirate gang that if they accept both of them into the gang, then they'll be making the best choice of their life by having the two of them. Two really good fighters, you know, more help is better, obviously. 
And then they accept it. They're yeah. like, oh, you know what? That's a great point to make. And yeah. yeah. And at that point, Jacopo is like, I am your man. Like, yeah. You spared my life. I will do whatever I can for you. Yeah. And, and then it, from there, they are. And then the revenge really gets a going. Yeah. <laughs> From there, it's like, all right, now we are going to about to go down. <laughs> We're going to get back at all those people. Yeah. So first, he returns to Marseille, which is where he grew up, and he leaves the pirates. Uh, Jacopo comes with him, and he goes to Mr. Morel, who was like the owner of the ship that he worked for, and he learns that uh, Edmond learns that his dad killed himself after hearing that he was arrested for being a traitor. Well, he's got. Has he gotten his treasure? He do- he goes to get that after he goes to Marseille. Oh, but he doesn't tell the guy that he is Edmund, though. No, 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 no. He he says he like knows Edmond, but he's not. He's just here to like learn where his family is and stuff. Yeah. And so, yeah, he learns that his dad killed himself. And then he learns that Mercedes married Fernand. Yeah, Fernand. And so he's like screw this i'm yeah this is when the plan for revenge like really gets set like he's like i'm going after everyone right i'm going after fernand i'm going after mercedes i'm going after Villefort. like everyone that put me in prison i'm getting my revenge on yep and so that's when him and Jacopo go and get the the treasure that Faria had told him about Mm -hmm. so he has the money and the wealth to be able to exact his revenge and the treasure they found on the island of Monte Cristo, which is why he then calls himself the, the Count, Count of Monte, Monte Cristo. Cristo. And he sets up this whole new identity of being this really wealthy count. And he shows up in like Paris, which is where everyone now lives. And he's that's when he starts his plan to exact his revenge. And Jim Caviezel just constantly reminds me of Christian Bale. I get that. Vi- yeah, I can see it. A bit of that vibe. Yeah. It, the look he has in this movie just constantly makes me think of Christian Bale and the prestige or something mm. like he's got that look. He's acts so well in this movie. The whole cast, like Guy Pierce also, he's always a good actor. But like something about this movie, they just play it so well. But yeah, now we get to into the good stuff, Adam. The revenge. Yeah. Ooh. And I'm very surprised that no one in the town thinks that he's Edmund. Or Edmond. Well, one person recognizes him right away. On, only the one. Yeah. But everyone else like, huh? Who, who is this man? Edmond is dead. Well, can't, that can't be Edmond. So first, the first person he exacts revenge upon is actually someone that we didn't even mention. It's like, who was the first mate in the very beginning? Dunglar. He was on the ship. He also turned over Edmond with Fernand. So that's like the first person he goes to. And it's great because every time right before he like kills these people, he like he says who he is. Right. He's like, I'm Edmond Dantes. You screwed me over. Now you die. You know, like Inigo Montoya and Princess Bride. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but yeah so first he kills Danglar and then he like like I said he sets himself up in Paris society to be this really successful and prominent like man um, and that's how he's, he's able to like weasel his way in and get the exact revenge he wants because he doesn't always kill sometimes he just like screws their life over like he does the Villefort yeah I mean Villefort happens uh, a bit later in the movie but with Villefort, it's really just all a matter of uh, him being in a in like a sauna. It makes me feel like I'm going off to like a spa. To, yeah, it's like the baths. Yeah, you know? <laughs> like I'm in the, in the spa, just having a good time, just turning the heat up. Like, okay, yeah, just uh, relaxing. Everything's all fine and dandy. And, and then the count shows and up. And then full <laughs> the count shows up. <laughs> oh yeah, you remember those times that you were making life horrible for uh, Edmond and uh, you were screwing him over? Like, um, I, I think I need to go now. <laughs> I am Edmond. Yeah, I am Edmond. Yeah. So Edmond, if, like, like you said, he traps him into this spa and he pretty much says, like, I know everything. Like, I know you sent me to prison because it was your father who was a Bonapartist. I know that you had Fernand kill your father um, so that you could move forward in, in life and get a higher you know, position in the government. But and- it's not just a matter of him only saying that to Villefort. It's I think I really enjoyed the way that scene was done because they show it 
in such a way where the cinematography and the editing was done, where they show Villefort sitting in the spa looking at Edmond. And then it does this nice, very well done, like direct cut Mm -hmm. that goes to the scene where it's the same exact shot and positioning of the actor that hits verbatim the same posture of the character of Villefort where he was sitting in the spa looking at Edmond in a certain way with his pose and then it cuts to the same exact posture and pose and face style everything Mm -hmm. in the other scene where he's looking at Fernand and I thought that was done so well for this movie just such a great look for the film to be able to pull that off that you know well done to the uh, the cinematography department or the cinematographer and also the editor for lining those shots up so well mm-hmm. and making that look so so good for for what it was because it's just a matter of the way the writing and the editing and the, the shots were done for him to be like i know what you did and then go to that shot and cut to the next scene it just looked and sounded so good uh the way it was put together yeah no i mean i love I love like talking about movies with you because I feel like because you make movies, you pick up a lot of that stuff. Like I never picked that up. Like I know I love this movie and I'm like, oh yeah, that's a great scene. But never to me, it was like, oh, it's a great scene because of the way that they edited and filmed it. So like you talking about that right now, I'm sitting here and I'm like, you're right. Like it does do that. (laughs) So interesting. It's a great movie. (laughs) A great movie all around. So yeah, so essentially he doesn't murder Villefort. What he does is in that sauna gets him to admit that he had his father killed and him falsely imprisoned so that Villefort then is arrested and sent to prison. He's got to deal with what Edmond had to deal with. Yeah, I mean, that whole scene, I could just keep going on with that scene, but I mean, I think it's just such a wonderful resolution for the film it's not quite the end of the film yet but it you know we're getting, we're there. getting there yeah and it's such a great tag to like come to a near resolution for the film where Villefort is one of the the guys who is the great baddie in this this film and obviously for Fernand is the real bad man mm-hmm. in this movie but Villefort is the other one and for Ed- Edmond to really just put the you know put the resolution on Villefort and be like I know everything that you did and I'm going to get you for it basically saying it like that he didn't quite say it that way but basically and just have him enclosed in this spa and telling him like I know everything that you did and here's all of the stuff that you did and I'm going to get you for it and Villefort trying to come back at him by saying you can't you know get me for this no one's going to believe you and then all of a sudden Edmund is telling him actually uh I do have a, people that are going to get you for right. this and then they all just come down into the spa to arrest him yeah. they're right there yeah and i think the next scene is so great too like it's dark as shit but i mean it's great <laughs> so they put Villefort in the you know the wagon to take him to prison and inside is a gun and the officer is like you know for for a gentleman as essentially being like Villefort can kill himself instead of having to live out the rest of his life in prison so Villefort tries to like he puts the gun in his mouth and and pulls the trigger but there's no bullet in it and like like, (laughs) Dantes like pops up through the window in the back of the wagon he's like did you really think I'd let you get away that easy no (laughs) it's like damn yeah Edmund just like you didn't think I'd make it that easy did you in the books Villefort it goes insane eventually we don't see that in the movie but I assume it probably happens as well yeah you just you only see Villefort in the car with Mm -hmm. the gun that's that's where they Mm kind of leave it off with you he tries to kill himself and then just like you didn't think I'd make it that easy did you and then that's it so now all we have left then is to talk about Fernand Mercedes and Albert yeah yeah and that gets very heated very quickly so so Albert is Mercedes and Fernand's son and the count sets up this whole like fake kidnapping in order to get close to Albert so that he can kind of weave himself into the family. And by doing so, Mercedes and him come into contact with each other. And Mercedes right away realizes it's Edmond 
She like knows it's Edmund and she tries to, you know, she's alone with him at the end, leaving this party. And she's like, I know it's you. Like I still have the string ring that we made. Like I've been waiting for you. And Dante is, is essentially like, fuck you. Like you didn't wait for me. You married Fernand as soon as I was gone. You know, like you didn't care about me at all. And Mercedes is like, that's not true. And Edmund's like, get away from me. Yeah. I mean, it's tough. I can imagine with, Edmond well, he's just being so set on revenge, so and, you know, yeah. and he's like, you didn't love me, obviously. But Jacopo is like, she loves you, man. You got a good woman. Screw this revenge and just take Mercedes and run. Yeah. And Albert is Edmond's child. But we don't learn that. We don't know that yet. But we do learn that. Yeah. And what we also learn, though, is that Fernand is like broke. He's had gambling debts. He has no money left. And all of his debts get called in. And so he's like, we need to run uh, to Mercedes. He's like, we need to leave. And at this point, Mercedes and, and Edmond are like, yes, let's be together. You know, like, I still love you. You still love me. And she's like, Mercedes goes to Fernand and she's like, I'm not leaving with you. We're done. And then she reveals that Albert is actually the son of Edmond Dantes and not Fernand. And Fernand's like, I, he was always a disappointment. It should also be known that in a prior scene that there was a giant party and Fernand was being a avoiding jerk bag <laughs> who wanted to talk about his plans with Villa uh, Villefort Villefort a uh, jerk bag talking to Villefort and avoiding um Mercedes and Albert and everyone at the party and while doing so, Mercedes thought that she had to make a toast for Albert for his birthday. Mm -hmm. And to save all of this, then the Count of Monte Cristo, Edmond, actually stood up and made the toast. And Albert was just loving the Count of Monte Cristo because not only did the Count um, in an even earlier scene save Albert from this uh, staged kidnapping mm -hmm. but he's also now toasting to albert and his like birthday. he's just making a great scene yeah. for well i think albert. he knows that his dad is shit yeah i mean it's obvious his dad is having affairs with other women like and he's a horrible man <laughs> yeah and while all this is going on edmond is clearly like standing up for and trying to be there for um albert yeah. so that's all happening in these pr prior scenes yeah but if we fast forward now, we've got the final scene going on where mm -hmm. there's Edmond um, having this um, scenario where. Um, well, he wants to leave with Mercedes, but he needs like one final showdown with Fernand. Yeah. So they go to this like ruined castle <laughs> where to, there's treasure chests to duel. Well, yeah. So he he uh, lures Fernand there saying like, this is where my treasure is kept. Right. right. Fernand shows up and the chests are empty. Yeah. It's nothing there. And that's when the count comes out and he tell admits to being Edmond. He's like, I am Edmond. You screwed me over. You took my wife and my life. Let's duel. Yeah. <laughs> but, they're fighting they're fighting uh albert shows up and he doesn't know yet that edmond is actually his dad so he actually steps in between edmond and fernand and is like edmond leave well, my dad alone yeah albert like, says that um he was told by someone else that right Ed, like, you like you cad <laughs> yeah. and then mercedes shows up and she's like everyone stop fighting albert you are the son of edmond dantes who you know as the count of monte cristo yeah. and then albert instantly is like well then fuck you mondego <laughs> like you were my father for the last 16 years but i don't care about you anymore yeah. so they all turn against fernand and fernand shoots mercedes yeah He's but like, she doesn't die we're good yeah he shoots her basically in like the shoulder yeah and then we have the final duel and don't forget louis louis guzman's also louis there Guzman's there. he's just kind of hanging around <laughs> he's standing there like uh i don't have a few jacobo's been here the whole time yep. <laughs> but yeah then we have some really great fight scenes out in the grass between Dantes well yeah because Mondego. fernand's out there just like i'm on Edmond! and then Edmond. Jacobo like go get him go and kill him <laughs> and he kills him yeah Edmund finally finishes him off so in the book 
another difference in the book uh for non commit suicide really yeah just because like you know all of his debts are being called and he has no money his life's in ruin so he commits suicide but they changed it for the movie which i think what they changed for the better um because yeah. this way it's like dantes is able to get his like final revenge yeah that wouldn't have been as exciting in a movie if yeah it's oh like... yeah we wouldn't have that cool fight scene at the end yeah. in the grass they have this like duel in the end and then fernand just goes out and leaves and just Meh. yeah that wouldn't have been as exciting so then his revenge has been completed he sp- takes all the money and he buys the Chateau d'If where he was in prison for 14 years. Uh, like, so no one else can be in prison there. And he gets to live out his life happily with Jacopo, Mercedes, and Albert. He just lives with Jacopo. Well, Jacopo is like his, his butler, <laughs> his man. And that's it. That's the movie, folks. That is That is the movie, yeah. And with that in mind, I would say we can talk about some of the reviews of this movie. Oh! Oh, can I do one fun fact before we go in? Sure. So during the fight scene, the duel at the end in the grass, while they were filming at one time, for uh, Jim Caviezel like accidentally really stabbed Guy Pierce, and Guy Pierce had to go to the hospital. Like he legitimately got stabbed. Oh. And uh, then for the rest of the movie, like Caviezel was always like so apologetic. He's like, I'm so sorry I did this. And Guy Pierce, on the other hand, is walking around bragging like, yo, I got stabbed. <laughs> That's rough. Do you know The Count of Monte Cristo was one of Mark Twain's favorite books? Ooh. And The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn contains a humorous spoof of Monte Cristo. I did not know that. Maybe I'll have to go reread Huckleberry Finn. <laughs> put, put it on my to-do list. I'm not a big Mark Twain fan. <laughs> Interestingly enough, on Rotten Tomatoes, the score for Count of Monte Cristo, at this time, 73% from critics and an 88% from the audience. Yeah. Not too shabby. Not too bad. It's great. I mean, I think it's tons of fun. Well, I did quote one of the like overall views from Rotten Tomatoes, and it was saying like, though this movie doesn't reach like any new artistic heights, it's an old fashioned yet enjoyable swashbuckler. You know, it's like it. It's just they're like it's nothing new, but it's a good action flick. <laughs> Essentially, is how they're explaining it. I did see Roger Ebert gave it three out of four stars. Which was pretty, was, was pretty good for Roger Ebert. Um, and he he kind of had the same view. So I, one of the quotes I pulled from him and he was saying like, this movie, it incorporates piracy and Napoleon, betrayal, you know, secrets, swashbuckling, like comic relief. Because Jacopo does have some like funny lines in there and everything. He's saying it like brings all of these things uh, in under two hours with performances by good actors who are clearly having fun. They're like, this is the kind of adventure picture the studios churned out in the golden age. And he's saying essentially that it's like so traditional that it feels new. Hmm. And that's why he liked it. Yeah, I like that. Another critic listed here posted the best swashbuckler since the Mask of Zorro. It does have Mask of Zorro vibes. I mean, the book itself, right, is it's along the same lines of Three Musketeers, you know, Man in the Iron Mask. We've got these like, it's of that time, that era. We got that like swashbuckling bits. So I could see the comparison also to Mask of Zorro for sure. I mean, I was telling you, the plot is very similar to Les Mis, right? Like, Les Mis isn't as action-y, but essentially it's the same thing, right? You have a man who's imprisoned for something either he didn't do or something so minuscule, like stealing a loaf of bread. And then he spends all this time in prison, and then when he gets out, he gets money through some not totally legal means. And having money <laughs> and then, means having power. Yeah. And I will say in Les Mis, it's not so much that he's trying to exact revenge. It's more that he's just trying to, like have a new life and avoid everyone else. So that's like the big difference. But the premises are fairly similar between the two. Yeah. Yeah. So with that being said, I think it's time for our slurps up or slurps down in this movie. Slurps up, meaning that we recommend it. We think that you should check it out. And we think that you should see this movie. Slurps down Meaning we do not think you should watch the movie. We do not think that you should check it out. And we think that the movie belongs outside of sight. Uh, Laura, 
slurps up or slurps down. I don't think it's any surprise from the way that I've talked through this entire episode that I give it a slurps up. Like I said, I watched this as a kid. I probably watched it soon after 2002, honestly. And I'm one of those people where if I like a movie, I watch it a lot. So this is one of the ones that I watched a fair amount of times for sure. I think it's great. I think the acting is amazing. I think the plot is great. It like keeps you on your toes. You know, it's not super, it's, it's, uh, what's the word I want? It's predictable. You know, you kind of know what you're going into, but it's enjoyable. It's just, it's a great movie to watch. And I think everyone should watch it. Slurps up. And for me, I'm going to give this movie a slurps up. I think that this movie is definitely worth checking out with the actors' performances in this movie, with the way that this movie was shot, and with the movie, just the the plot line in this movie, I think it's fun and just adventurous in terms of a, a thriller for what, what you got going on. I think the story is worth viewing, and yeah, definitely check it out. Um I, I, I don't have anything else to say on that one, yeah. really. I could just keep rambling on. It's but, great. Go watch it. Yeah. <laughs> We've had a lot of slurps up lately. We need to pick a movie that's bad. Listeners, if you've got an idea of a <laughs> movie a you want us down. to check out, please check us out on social media and send us a message or something. Because if you've got some trash of a film or something great that you want us to review, send us a message. Give us some ideas. We'll take anything. And we will do a review on it. Give me it. another Hell Comes to Frogtown. I want another bad movie. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Screen Slurps request on this episode. <laughs> we want some movie suggestions. Give me crap. <laughs> <laughs> and with that being said, that wraps it up for this episode of Screen Slurps. Be sure to follow us on social media at Screen Slurps on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. Be sure to listen to us on Spotify, Ghana, or any other podcast streaming service out there. And if you enjoy what you hear, slide on over to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star rating. It will help us a lot. And if there's any crazy movies that you want to hear about, let us know. Leave a comment on one of our social media pages. And trust me when I say we will be sure to talk about it. How many times do I have to say it? Please do it. So closing out, I'm Adam Meisner. And I'm Laura Meisner. Slurps up and we will catch you later. Later.